day, good afternoon on this glorious October day. The leaves are falling, the weather is warm. We're getting ready for Sukkot. Sukkot is the time of celebration. It's the time when God says you prayed, you cried, you begged forgiveness, and now I'm giving you a beer hug. I'm going to wrap you around in the sukkah, and I'm going to embrace you for who you are, for what you are. And we're going to be able to celebrate as one community, as one nation. Micha Amcha Ki Yisrael. Who is like the Jewish people? Our commitment, our devotion to God through trial and tribulation, through challenge and through struggle. We just said in the prayer of Yom Kippur, God, don't forget us. We never forgot you. I need to tell you a beautiful sukkah story that I heard that had always inspired me as my children behind work on the sukkah, which will be up in time for sukkahs and after services we'll be able to have a l'chaim, make kiddush, make a blessing so everyone can get the mitzvah hopefully in a safe way recognizing and being cognizant of the challenges we live in. So this is the story. There was a great Hasidic master who lived in Russia in the Soviet Union. This happened in the late 1800s. And his favorite mitzvah was the mitzvah of the etrog. We all know we take the most beautiful citrus, we take a palm tree, we take a willow, we take a myrtle, two willows and three myrtles, and we bring them all together. The Rebbe teaches us that these four species represent four different types of Jews. The lulav, excuse me, the esrog, which you can make jam out of it, it tastes delicious and also smells delicious. Fragrance represents what others benefit from. When you smell good, other people around you benefit. That's someone who does good deeds. And taste is what you impact yourself. It's the study of Torah. It says the Rebbe, there's four types of Jews. There's the Esrog, the guy who has good deeds, and he studies. There's the Lulav, which creates, comes from a palm tree, we get dates, but yet it has no taste. Excuse me, it has no smell. That's the person who studies Torah, but doesn't really have good deeds. He doesn't impact the world. And then you have the myrtle that smells delicious but has no taste. That's the guy who does so many good deeds to help others, but he doesn't study himself and further his intellect and his connection with God. And then we have the willow. The willow is the Jew who has no connection. He doesn't do good deeds. He doesn't study. Gurnish, as we say in Yiddish. But guess what? When we do the mitzvah of the four species, which we'll do Sunday for the first time, and by the way, throughout the holiday, anyone that wants to come over at any time, there'll be someone at our home. You ring the bell during the day, and someone will make the blessing with you on the lalav and that trog, and you'll get the mitzvah. But ha what happens if you have a citrus, you have a palm tree, you have a myrtle, but you're missing a willow? You might think a willow, that represents the guy who doesn't study, doesn't do mitzvot. What do I need it for? tell us the rabbis the Jewish people are not complete we don't accomplish the mitzvah we have set out to if we don't have every single Jew if we don't bring all the Jewish people together as one no matter what their level of knowledge is no matter what their good deeds are they're part of the community and that's something we need now more than ever when we're so fragmented and we're so challenged on so many levels there's so much division we need the unity of the lolav and the trog and the sukkah that embraces all of us with the hug and the holiness of god so this rabbi he loved the lolav and the trog and every year his chassidim already knew a couple of months before they started looking where they're going to get the most beautiful exquisite etrog it should have a beautiful shape and it should smell deliciously no stains, no spots on it. And everyone knew that the Rebbe would come and he would bless the Lulav and Etrog and then, and, then, and, then, and then people would want to use the Rebbe's Lulav and Esther because it was so beautiful and exquisite. Well, one year, everyone knew there was an issue. There was no Lulav and Etrogs to get. Nothing, nada. And the Chassidim were devastated. What are they going to do? How are they going to get a Lulav and a special Esrog for the Rebbe? 
if they don't have one for this Hasidic master, the whole city will feel different. The Rebbe won't be able to celebrate and bless and they won't be able to. What are they going to do? And finally they heard there was a guest in town. And the guest in town had come and he was going to be away from his family. But he was going back to be with his family for Sukkot. And they asked him, they heard he has the most exquisite etrog. So they asked him, could we have it for the Rebbe? For the Rebbe. He says, are you kidding me? I need it for my own family. How would I ever give it away? So they said, listen, the Rebbe leads the whole community here and everyone will bless on it. He's such a holy spiritual man. Please, could you give it to our master? And he said, absolutely not. And it went back and forth till he finally agreed to give it on one condition. He said, I'll stay here in town. I'll give it to the Rebbe, but it's on one condition. I want a place in the world to come, in the world of truth after I pass. I want a place right near the Rebbe. If the Rebbe guarantees me that he's going to give me a place right near him in the world to come, then I'll give him my asset. Chassidim were white. How could they ask the Rebbe such a thing? And would the Rebbe even agree? But there was no choice. Sukkot was getting closer. So they went to the Rebbe and they told the Rebbe the story. And the Rebbe said, absolutely not a problem. Tell him that if he gives me his Esra, then I guarantee him a place next to me in the world to come in the Garden of Eden. And that's what happened. So this man ends up staying in town for the holiday of Sukkot. And as the tradition is, he's a guest. The first night of Sukkot, he comes to Shul and he's looking for someone to take him home so he can get the mitzvah of making the blessing in the sukkah. What greater mitzvah than to make the blessing in the sukkah? Usually, if you were a guest in town, you sat in Shul in the back and someone would come over to you and would say, hey, please join me in my sukkah. But no one did. Realizing that no one did, he was devastated, but he had no choice. He has to make Kiddush and the Motzi in the sukkah. So he goes knocking on door to door of the sukkahs of the people in the community. And to each one, people had these beautifully decorated sukkahs with these delicious smells and aromas of delicious food. And so many people and so much singing, but no one would let him in. One place, two places. Couldn't understand which Jewish community won't allow a guest to get the mitzvah of making a blessing in the sukkah. Until finally he broke out crying. And one guy said, I'm sorry. I would love to let you come in. But the Rebbe, our master, forbade anyone from allowing you to make a blessing in their sukkah. Now he's even more perplexed. The Rebbe, who he gave his beautiful esrib to, is not allowing him to make a blessing in the sukkah? What kind of Rebbe is that? So finally he finds out where the Rebbe's sukkah is and he comes knocking on the door. And he asks the Rebbe if he could make a blessing in the sukkah. And the Rebbe said, you could come into my sukkah, you could eat whatever you want, you could drink, you can make the kiddush, you can make the moti, but it's on one condition. You give up your place in the world to come that I promised you next to me. The guy shocked. Is this a Rebbe? Is he cynical? This is what he does? He's blackmailing me? What should the guy do? To him, the greatest cherished thing was to have a place in the world to come, but yet, the first night of Sukkot is an obligation to make a blessing in the Sukkah. How could he give it up? It goes back and forth in his mind until he finally says, you know what? I cannot go through the first night of Sukkot without making a blessing in the Sukkah. I give up my place, he looks at the Rebbe. He says, I give back my promise to you. You don't have to give me a place next in the world to come. But let me just eat in your Sukkah. The Chassidim are more shocked. What's the Rebbe doing here? How's he blackmailing a guy like this? The guy sits down, broken. He makes the kiddush, makes the motzi. He sits down, they bring him all these delicious foods. And then the Rebbe turns to Chassidim. And he said, I want to tell you something. You see, I promised this guy that if he gives me his lul of an etro, I'll give him a place in the world to come next to me. But I didn't want him just to get it. I wanted him to deserve it. I wanted him to earn it. I wanted his place in the world to come, not because he gave me something, but because he truly deserved it and earned it through his hard work. When this guy was ready to give up his place in the world to come just to make a blessing in the sukkah, 
just to fulfill a mitzvah that God gave us. He's ready to give up such an important thing. Now he gets it, not because I promised him, but because he deserves it. The mitzvah is his because he embraced and he cherished God's commandments and the place in the world to come is his. And I think about the story. I think about the Jews who built sukkahs in Siberia and in, in, in the former Soviet Union under terrible rule during the Holocaust. I think about us today, how all of us went out to show and tried to be in an in-person service, service even though we needed a mask and even though we we needed social distancing because we didn't want to miss an opportunity to be connected to God. That's the story of the Jewish people. It's overcoming challenges. Every obstacle that's thrown our way, we jump right over it. And we never lose faith, even in a time of uncertainty, to be close to Hashem. And that's the story of the sukkah. The sukkah is the idea of God embracing us, of us giving gratitude. It's the, it's the season of harvest when we give thank you to Hashem for the blessings in our life. And we say, we love you, we're connected, we're going to rejoice. We're going to rejoice in our holidays and we're going to be joyful because that's what God said. I, there's a problem, we're not sure what's going to be tomorrow. We're worried about COVID cases, we're worried about a job, we're worried about other challenges we have. Yes. But at the end of the day, our connection to our God supersedes it all and allows us that moment to jump above it and to celebrate the love and connection of a Jew to Hashem. My friends, if you don't have a sukkah, make sure to come by and stop by our sukkah to make a blessing. Blessing on the sukkah and make a blessing. A blessing on the lulav and a trog. Our sukkah is open to everyone to celebrate our pride, our Judaism, our love, and to remember that we are connected to God throughout all the challenges. God bless you. Have a great day. I'll see you all tomorrow.